Henry was born in Ohio in the late 1950s. He was a star of track and field, first in his class and president of the Student Body Association, as American as an Aaron Copeland symphony. He married Patricia Fitzgerald while still in college. Two sons arrived soon after, and Henry was on his way to a life of success and diligence and robust Episcopalianism. And of strapping ascendant young men with bright futures and beautiful families had secret desires and shameful urges, they hid them from the world, from themselves. Henry worked hard, kept his head down, and his hands to himself. Eventually, his hard work led him out of the Midwest and into the heart of American business, as well as the heart of American temptation, New York City. The Wilcox family arrived on July 3rd, 1981, the same summer I arrived. Like so many before me, I arrived in New York, a refugee from a home that had grown hostile to my presence. I was aware from an early age that I made people uncomfortable. I was moony and effeminate. But small towns have the peculiar habit of tolerating their feathery, delicate boys. But once I grew older, my parents sent me to ministers, to doctors, to fitness instructors, even. Every walk through town felt dangerous. Every school day possessed the potential for violence. I would steal my mother's sleeping pills, hoarding them, planning my suicide. I would stare at them nightly, holding them in my hands. Until one night, perilously close to swallowing them, I was struck with the realization that I didn't want to change and that what I hated wasn't my nature, but rather my circumstances. And so I left to seek not my fame and certainly not my fortune, but rather and rather simply my dignity. The only place I knew to go was New York. I read all about the events of June 1969 it was the only place in the world I knew to look for young men like me. Imagine me at 19 years old in the middle of Times Square. In 1981, my mother's old Samsonite suitcase in my hands, asking strangers for directions to the Stonewall Inn. Eventually, I was given directions by a very friendly pimp. I rode the graffiti-covered subway downtown, gripping my suitcase so tightly that blisters formed on my hands. I made my way to the fabled Stonewall Inn, only to discover that it has become a Chinese restaurant. We can imagine my disappointment, but I was very hungry and I had never eaten Chinese food before, so I stayed in Mr. Shun's dim sum emporium, and I knew that I had made the right decision. Henry, meanwhile, is not so certain. He's 24 and already the father of two young boys, earning more money in a month than most men twice his age make in a year. He owns a four bedroom house in White Plains and he commutes daily to his office downtown. There's Henry knocking back after work cocktails with his colleagues. There's Henry in the steam room at the East Side Club. There's Henry on the 1130 train, heading home to his family. There's Henry in the shower, remorseful and penitent attempting to expunge his great secret from his skin. And there's Henry, sliding into bed at one in the morning, next to a wife who suspects more than she lets on. We meet at a rooftop party overlooking Christopher Street. Henry has rented an apartment in the city while his family spends its summer in Montauk. I notice him first, and I am thunderstruck by the sight of him. Chestnut brown hair, worn slightly long, as was the style of the day. Fairly developed chest, threatening the integrity of the polo shirt he was wearing. I step into his line of sight, and wait to be noticed. It doesn't take long. We chat for as long as we can stand, and then we head back to his apartment and to his bed. 
Henry was the first, the only man I ever loved. No, that's a blatant lie, and shame on me for telling it. Henry Wilcox was the only man I ever needed to be loved by. It was in Henry's gaze, from his kisses and through his touch, that I finally glimpsed my own worth. I fell hard into Henry's handsomeness, his intelligence, his potential. No, not his potential, his certainty. I was never meant to be Henry's life partner. I was the person he was dancing with when the music stopped. By that point, whispers of disease had graduated to rumors. Rumors became stories, and stories became fact. Henry had arrived at the party just in time for it to end. For five years, Henry and I clung to each other for safety, for comfort, as the city burned around us. By the summer of 1987, we had had enough of funerals and hospital visits, and the sight of thousands of once vital men being laid to waste, we decided to look for a house as far from civilization as we could find. We finally stumbled upon a rambling old farmhouse on an aimless country road three hours north of here, built in the late 18th century. It's set off from the road, so you have the illusion of being alone in the world. And in front of the house, my favorite thing on the property, an enormous cherry tree that has been there since the time George Washington was out terrorizing them. It puts on the most astonishing show twice a year. In the autumn, it burns deep orange and red leaves as if the tree were on fire. And in the spring, vibrant blushing flowers which eventually fall ever so gently to the ground in an aerial ballet. And I don't know if you'll believe me, but it's true. Deep in the trunk of the tree are a set of pig's teeth that were put there, I don't know how many generations ago. The superstition among the colonials was that if you bite the bark of the tree, it cures all ailments. But of course it does, it's pure superstition. And yet there in the country on the rolling pasture land with flowers and breezes and cherry trees with pig's teeth stuck in the bark, there was no death. There was no illness. There was no loss or danger. Henry bought it the next day. And we lived there for over a year without ever leaving the area. We cooked, we gardened, we read underneath the cherry tree. And we avoided all news from our friends from the outside world. After a year, uh, Henry grew restless. He started traveling to London, um, the first of his many ventures there, uh, that would eventually make him a very wealthy man. Without him, I began to stew. And so early one morning, I decided to return to the city. I hadn't been there in over a year. I was terrified about what I might find. And I was about to take myself to lunch when I ran into an old friend of ours. Peter West was his name. Dear Peter. Darling man, more clever than anyone I ever knew, and has him a sin. I wouldn't have recognized him if he hadn't called to me from across Fifth Avenue. Peter had the look, the telltale signs that someone was infected. His handsome face was sunken and sallow, his muscles were all melted away. It was clear in one glance that he had it. He was also, I discovered, essentially homeless. His landlord had evicted him he had been estranged from his family for years. He had nowhere to go. I took the next train upstate and phoned for a cab. The driver took one look at Peter and fled. 
We stood there four miles from my house with no other means to get there but our legs. The day was beautiful and Peter smiled as he breathed in the country air through his rattling lungs. The sun was setting as we approached the house. I could feel a release in Peter's body. I put him in one of the rooms upstairs. Peter spent the next five days slowly dying. I cleaned him when he fouled himself. I held him as he wept in grief. I comforted him as he screamed in pain. I had no idea I had such strength. On Peter's fourth day, Henry returned from London. When I told him that Peter was upstairs, Henry flew into a rage, accusing me of betrayal, of bringing the plague into our home. I never seen such fear on a man's face as I saw in Henry's on that day. And then he got back into his car and drove away. Peter died as the sun was rising his fifth day with us. Henry returned to London, leaving me alone for several months without so much as a phone call. I spent the first few weeks of my exile wondering if I was wrong to show such kindness to a friend. But oh, Eric, to see Peter's ravaged face and to look into those frightened eyes, I believe that if I would have left him on that sidewalk, returning to my place of peace without him, I would have ruined that house for myself far more than I ever could have ruined it for Henry. I eventually came to see that leaving the city and our friends behind was as unforgivable an act of cowardice as I have ever performed. The answer, I realized, was not to shut the world out but rather to fling the doors open and to invite it in. And so, while Henry's furious silences roared at me from across the Atlantic, I brought others in their last days up to the house. I replayed that scene over and over with friends, with acquaintances and eventually with strangers. One by one, they came to my house, and one by one, they died there. After several months, Henry had his lawyers draw up the paperwork to name me the sole owner of the house. Peter West is the reason that house became my property. It would not be the blessed place that it is if it had not first hosted Peter's torture and his death. Henry cannot see it that way. And that's Henry's to sort out. I think that even after 36 years, Henry and I are still sorting it out. If it is ever to be sorted.